Welcome to episode 76 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. We get to speak to retired agent Dr. Jerry Clark, PhD, who served a total of 21 years in federal law enforcement. Jerry Clark was an NCIS agent and a DEA agent prior to becoming a special agent with the FBI. Jerry Clark was previously interviewed on this podcast, episode 13, about one of the most bizarre bank robbery schemes in the history of the FBI, known officially as Collar Bomb. In this episode, Jerry Clark reviews the criminal activity and trial of Marjorie Dell Armstrong, the mastermind behind the collar bomb pizza delivery case, and he also discusses other female serial killers. Dr. Jerry Clark has a PhD in criminology and he is currently an assistant professor of criminal justice at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. He and his co-author, Ed Palatella, have written their third true crime book, Mania and Marjorie Dell Armstrong, Inside the Mind of a Female Serial Killer, which will be released on September 12th, 2017. You can learn more about Dr. Jerry Clark and his other true crime books by visiting the Pizza Bomber website. Before we get to the interview, I just want to remind you that August 1st is the premiere of the Discovery miniseries, Manhunt the Unabomber. I plan to be there watching every episode. The miniseries follows Jim Fitzgerald, the FBI agent who tracked down Ted Kaczynski, a.k.a. the Unabomber, and brought him to justice through his expertise in profiling and linguistics. Now, Jim Fitzgerald, the real Jim Fitzgerald, will be the first to tell you that this character is actually a composite of all of the agents involved in the Unabomber investigation. You can hear more about Jim's actual contributions, his forensic linguistic contributions to the Unabomber case by listening or re-listening to episode three. You can also learn more about the Unabomber case by listening to case agent Max Knoll, who we spoke to in episode 55 and 56. It might be fun to listen to the real investigation and compare it to how TV taking dramatic license portrays the investigation and the people involved. And as I said many times before, based on the need to condense information and to make it an exciting and dramatic read or show, books and TV at times manipulate facts. I also want to give a quick shout out to Lynn Button, who let me know that he is the first member of my newly formed Scottish fan club. Thanks, Lynn. And I want to say thank you to listeners who have picked up a copy of Pay to Play, my FBI crime thriller about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or as a gift for someone you know loves crime fiction, you're helping to support me in producing ad-free content on a weekly basis. So thank you. Now, here's the show. Hi, Jerry. I'm glad to have you back. Jerry, thank you for having me back. It's good to talk to you again. Yes. So the last time you were uh, on the show, on episode 13, so long ago, I'm actually, yeah, this is going to be like episode 77 or something like that. But yours definitely has been and continues to be one of my most popular episodes. So excited to have you back again. Thank you so much. And that case still lives on. And um, I still get a lot of interest in the case and and love talking about it. So uh, with this new information that um, we have in our book uh, regarding Marjorie Deal Armstrong, it's sort of, in my mind, a continuation of that whole case, which has fascinated everybody. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because 
when we were talking about the collar bomb or the pizza bomber case, we spent a lot of time talking about Brian Wells, who yes. was the quote unquote victim. And it was at the very end, it was almost like a mystery novel or a suspense novel. At the very end, that's when we learn about Marjorie. Yeah. But we didn't get to learn a lot. So I think, I know I'm excited to, to hear more about what makes her tick and, and what her issues were and why she went around killing all these men. So let's get yeah. started. Yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating. And what what made that case were the characters and the group of characters that found each other, and Marjorie Deal Armstrong being one of those characters, uh, and her being female and, and being involved with these people, and yet outside of these people having her own issues with all these deaths around her, made her such fascinating material for us, and just sort of a logical uh, sequential next step on where to go with some of this. So we originally started out, my co-author and I, Ed Palatella, on, you know, talking about female serial killers just because we had this association with Marjorie Deal Armstrong. And it was such a rare and unique thing to have contact. And I interviewed her nine times and got to really know her and, and, you know, went through trial with her and so just had spent so much time with her that when we started writing the book, uh, by the way, which is called Mania and Marjorie Deal Armstrong, Inside the Mind of a Female Serial Killer, we sort of thought, you know, we have such a unique perspective because we've actually talked to, uh, you know, and, and dealt with this woman. So, we started out with the idea of, of doing, in general, female serial killers, just as a topic, and then decided, you know what, since we have this background and backdrop with her, let's use her as the case study and the main focus of the book. And that's basically what we did. So we still go through the book. We wanted to provide an understanding of her and uh, others like her, uh, people who, and, and specifically females who kill um, the the book also gets into and explores uh, mental illness and and its relationship to criminality and the history of of even the diagnostic and statistical manual mental disorders. We get into that. Um, we discuss the differences between insanity and and uh, incompetency, which Marjorie Deal Armstrong uh, eventually was diagnosed as incompetent to stand trial for a period of time. So we go through that whole process. We look at the history of other female serial killers and really discuss a number of different ones in the book. And I'll go through several of them just to give you an idea who we talked about. Um, can, I, can I ask you one question sure. before you move on? Sure. How many female serial killers are there? Because almost all the time, you know, we're hearing about male serial killers. Are there a lot of female serial killers? One out of six serial murderers are female. So that's like 16% are female serial killers. They're very, very rare in the Yeah, that number of, seems high to me. <laughs> it does, actually. And when we researched, I thought, boy, that's a little higher. But what that includes in there, Jerry, are the, you know, angels of death, you know, nurses that are killing patients because... They feel that, um, you know, their life isn't, uh, you know, at, at a, a quality level. So they take it upon themselves to take their lives, uh, you know, things of that nature. But if you break down the women who kill like men, serial killers like Bundy or like Gacy or like Dahmer, that's a very rare category. And that's one that Marjorie Deal Armstrong fit into. And uh, that's what made her so unique. So while that 16% does seem high, and I agree, you would think it would be less, they include all the different um, emotional killers that are involved to uh, mothers who kill their children, you know, three or four children. In fact, we just saw that recently on the news, which is so sad when, when that happens. Mm. Um, but the, the, the female killers like Eileen Wernos, who would kill people that she didn't even know uh, in, you know, relationship to being or the thought of being mistreated, uh, make them very unique. And that's sort of where Marjorie fit. And we go through uh, the several of the deaths that were involved with Marjorie. She's 
had six men die around her. Now, I, I go through uh, with Ed Palatella in the book how those men all <laughs> reached their demise just knowing Marjorie Deal Armstrong. And then lastly, we sort of fit it into the pizza bomber case and actually go through some of the things that she did, how she acted, uh, her interviews, you know, my discussions with her, uh, all which make that very fascinating uh, as a read. So wow. it's, it's pretty interesting. So if you look, in, in how we can start is sort of how I walk through the contents of, uh, of the book. Uh, we talk about Marjorie Deal Armstrong's pattern of violence in the very beginning and the six deaths that were linked to her. If you look at Marjorie Deal Armstrong as a case study, very, very interesting that that she was an only child from successful parents. And she was extremely bright extremely bright. She had multiple degrees, a master's degree, a very high IQ, which really, when we went back and researched for the book, we found a study that was done in 2015 by Marissa Harrison on female serial killers. And Marjorie sort of fit into a lot of the categories that that she had, which include 88.7% of female serial killers are Caucasian. Uh, and Marge was, 54% were married. Now, she was married at one time, but she killed one of her husbands, which I talk about. <laughs> so that was one that she uh, she fit into that category also. Um, the mean age, 32, but there was a range of killers in this study that turned out, and by the way, she studied 64 different female serial killer cases to come up with all these statistics, but and, and usually I don't try to get caught up in statistics, but some of this I just found to be fascinating, that 34% of those female serial killers out of those 64 had college degrees. And wow. Again, Marjorie Deal Armstrong fit into that category. You might not see that on the male serial killer side uh, at all. Uh, 12% were considered high intelligent, and again, that fits uh, Marge. Uh, 50% of those female serial killers she studied uh, used poison or some sort of drugging of their victims. Uh, Marge uh, uh, obviously used uh, a gun, which in this instance, in this study, was only 10.9% of the time those female serial killers used a gun. So it, it also indicates how she fit into a lot of the categories, but was very different in that um, she didn't really have uh, some sort of compassion like a relative or something like that where she felt like I, I need to help them by killing them, it, it, even though that sounds sort of uh, warped. Warped. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was warped. Um, she just had this uh, feeling that she disliked men, uh, obviously quite a bit, and it went through her history. She started all the way back in 1984 with her first killing, which was a boyfriend at the time. And she actually went out, bought a handgun, brought it home. While he was sleeping on the couch, she shot him six times. And I swear it's that old adage, well, why'd you stop at six? Well, I, I ran out of bullets. And that's exactly <laughs> what she did. I mean, she would have kept going. That shows the rage and the anger that she had. Now, what's interesting about that very first killing of her six that, that she was around, she, was, she, she went to trial and was acquitted. And the first uh, defense used in Erie County, Pennsylvania, where we... Uh, that case was uh, was a battered spouse or, or, or a significant other syndrome where she was able to determine or at least declare that, that she had been abused by this uh, boyfriend and shot him in self-defense. Now, how you shoot someone six times sleeping on the couch in self-defense, we're not sure, but she actually was acquitted on that case. And I think it gave her this power um, to feel that she was above it all. And and it just went from there. A second boyfriend that she dated died of a suicide, or at least it was ruled a suicide. And, you know, looking back now, again, this is 1985, looking back now, you might think, boy, I'd love to revisit that 
and take a look at the circumstances involved in that. Do we know how he took his life? He hung himself. Now, again, that might take some doing, you know, with with her uh, being involved, but who knows how she manipulated men. She had this real hold over people that made men do things for her that were unbelievable. And we saw that in the pizza bomber case where she actually had Bill Rothstein, her boyfriend at that time, you know, move a dead body into his garage where they put it in a freezer and we're going to, you know, chop it up and put it in an ice chipper. I mean, to talk somebody into something like that for help is, is uh, you know, I guess a considered a skill set, but she certainly had that manipulative power. Then in 1992, she was actually married to this guy, Richard Armstrong, and that's where Neil uh, Ar- Armstrong, uh, she got her name. But um, she rushed him to the hospital bleeding um, from his ear and said he fell and hit the coffee table. He died two days later, uh, certainly suspicious, but they ruled it. Uh, accidental. Uh, we heard years later that it might have been uh, one of those circumstances uh, related to a violent act with her hitting him with a baseball bat, but it was one of those ones, again, that were never charged and never went any further. So that's the third death around her. Then certainly the next three involve this whole, you know, collar bomb, pizza bomber case, including in 2003, when she actually went through the Erie Times news, newspaper researching how to buy a shotgun. And this is fascinating because this came out in trial in the pizza bomber case. But her boyfriend, James Roden, at the time uh, was laying in bed again. And she walked into the room and shot him two times with a shotgun right in the back. Wow. And that would be the poor individual that they end up putting in the freezer uh, at Bill Rothstein's house where they were going to, um, again, chop chop that up and, and spread his pieces throughout the county. So that was another killing. By the yeah, way, I, when, I guess it's, it's, it's hard to kind of be able to say self-defense when you're using a shotgun and shooting somebody in the back. Exactly, and the planning on this was phenomenal. I sort of went through it quickly, but... Basically, she went through the newspaper. When she went to buy this from a private citizen, by the way, this private citizen testified at trial for us, he said that she asked him, hey, if I shot this in a house, would you hear it? And he said, yes, but why would you ever shoot it in a house? <laughs> and she she said, well, I'm just asking. And then she said, can you load it for me? And he said, no, I'm not. you're not allowed to drive with a loaded shotgun. So he wouldn't do it. But he actually sold her this this gun. And she waited until a stormy night when it was thundering and lightning so that, you know, the, the noise from the thunder would maybe mask the the two gunshot wounds or gunshots in, into James Roden, which to me is just some planning that's so diabolical you can't, can't imagine. Um, and then the fifth person, Brian Wells, Obviously, in the bank robbery case, uh, he dies during the the um, bank robbery where it's a live device around his neck, and she was intricately involved in the whole scheme and planning of that event. And uh, the last one was Robert Panetti, who was the second pizza delivery driver in the pizza bomber case, who died of a drug overdose that we now know to be a hot shot that, again, Marjorie Deal Armstrong had involvement in to get rid of him as a witness so this this type of thinking from her was just so unique and so rare for a female that she seemed more like a male serial killer than than actually what some of the females did except for eileen wernos who seemed very very similar to her um but very interesting. And then, by the way, if you look at the crux of the whole pizza bomber case, which really is fascinating, it's the bank robbery was done in order for Marjorie Deal Armstrong to obtain money to pay Ken Barnes, another co-conspirator in the case, to kill her own father to get his inheritance. So 
she actually had tried to plan to kill her own father, which would have been number seven. Wow. So her history is just phenomenal. And we thought when we started writing the book, well, wow, let's let's really put her as the backdrop of what these uh, female serial killers do. Now, you did say that in her case, uh, well, I guess anybody who who uh, you know decides to uh, kill a number of people would be quote unquote you know mentally ill or crazy, right. but she was actually diagnosed with with several different mental illnesses. Right, exactly, and and that's a great lead-in, Jerry, to some of the other things that we discuss in the book, which was mental illness and criminality, and you know, quite honestly, there's a very very different um, difference between insanity which is really more likely to be you know your mindset at the time of the offense versus incompetency which is your mindset at the time of trial and so uh insanity defenses are are pretty rare quite honestly because you have to prove you know the differences between knowing right and wrong at the time of the commission of the act for Marjorie that was never the issue she was definitely sane enough to know the difference between right and wrong. What her issue was, was competency. Now, you you mentioned that I was able to go back with the FBI and get a PhD, and a lot of my uh, research and dissertation was on competency to stand trial because it was right at the time I was in trial with Marge, and I was trying to understand what exactly this whole competency issue was. So my, my dissertation is on restoration to competency, comparing intellectual functioning and psychiatric diagnosis to the ability to be restored. And it all fit and was all driven by my my background with dealing with Marjorie. You're just trying to understand her. Oh, my gosh, just the complexity of it all. And competency, really, you only have to prove two things. One, that you understand the whole proceedings against you. All right, so what it is you're involved in, what it is that the jury does, what the judge does, what's the prosecutor's role. All those things involve your ability to understand the proceedings. Marjorie, when they were doing her competency evaluation, knew all those roles better than the person interviewing her. I mean, she was... It wasn't that prong of the competency that she had the issue with. The second prong of competency is your ability to assist in your own defense. And that's where she had trouble. She Mm -hmm. could not provide her lawyer with the assistance that they needed to get her a, a fair trial. So that's when they sent her away. Uh, for competency restoration. And she was actually sent twice in her case. When she was arrested for killing James Roden, which was her boyfriend who ended up in the freezer, and then we restored the competence. She came back and pled guilty to that and was sentenced to 7 to 20 years. And that's when she was indicted for the, her role in the collar bomb case and went federally uh, in the United States Attorney's Office and the United States District Court Judge Judge McLaughlin ruled her incompetent at that point again. So, so what she, was it that she couldn't provide or that she wasn't doing for her defense? She would not cooperate. She didn't think anybody was as smart as her. She didn't think anybody knew her, could understand her. She wouldn't tell them exactly you know, what happened, what her role was, and they couldn't figure out how to best provide a defense for her because they didn't know exactly what she had done. And it was making it very difficult for them to provide or come up with some uh, instance to defend her. And even in the trial, it was so convoluted because her defense attorney uh, by the way, she fired the first one, who was a fantastic federally uh, appointed uh, public defender, and she fired him because she couldn't get along with him, and the judge allowed it, and then she was assigned a new attorney, and he was working really hard for her, and she couldn't get along with him, and the judge finally said, 
listen, we're not firing this one. You have had the opportunity to fire one in the past. It's obviously, you know, you that's not cooperating, not them. And so he he actually had her go through with a uh, trial with that attorney. Now that attorney and her disagreed in a number of different aspects. She wanted to testify. He didn't want her to testify, didn't believe she'd uh, help herself at all. So she did what was called a narrative. I've never seen this done, really, in trials that I've been in, where the judge let her just go take the stand and, without questioning, just start talking. And um, there was no direct examination, in other words, by her um, defense attorney. But what it allowed us to do was cross-examine her, because once she took the stand, you can cross. And so the United States attorney then just, you know, was able to take her to places that showed different sides of her that wasn't in her best interest. So her defense attorney was right in not wanting her to get up and, and speak, but uh, she just couldn't stop herself. I, I, and looking at some of the newspaper articles uh, uh, about her, it, one of the things they say is that she talked, cons- you know, in, in What's the word I want to use? Incessantly. <laughs> That's yes. the word. Yes. Um, so I can only imagine what it was like to have her up on the stand just, you know, talking, 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 talking. Was she making any sense? She makes sense in the respect that she definitely um, knows what she's trying to say. She doesn't make it in her best interest by trying to prove that. Let me give you an example. In fact, nine times I interviewed her. And she, all all the people that you interview that are antisocial personality disorder, uh, and by the way, she had several personality disorders, none of which precluded her from being competent. So you can still have some mental disorders, uh, including bipolar, which they fought over vigorously, uh, the defense attorney uh, and, and his expert witness thought she was bipolar and then had several different personality disorders, histrionic, antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. Um, and she had all those. But that does not preclude you from being competent in the respect, can you know the proceedings and can you assist in your own defense? And our uh, and I say our, but the prosecution's uh, expert witness even fought the f- fact that she was bipolar. He wasn't even sure because we had seen her manic, but we had never really seen her in a depressed uh, state. So they didn't know if it was just a mania or a hypomania or something that she had, but she was definitely able to get up on the stand and try to put her point across. And it sounds rational, except for the fact that it didn't fit a lot of the other evidence. Mm -hmm. And so her defense mechanisms, just like you see in any antisocial personality disorder, there's really three big ones. There's projection, where everybody else's fault, right? Um, It was Bill Rothstein. He put me in these places so that the police and the FBI would see me and then it looked like I was guilty. So like a, a real projection and a rationalization is the next one where she rationalized everything, uh, had an excuse for everything. It was everybody else's fault. It was never hers. And then certainly the minimization. You always see everybody trying to downplay you know, how important it was in their involvement. And she did all three of those throughout every interview I had with her. But what was amazing in the interviews with her is she would, and this is how she treated everybody, she would try to get you distracted. And this is another one of those female serial killer and antisocial personality traits where if you even watch some of the interviews of Eileen Wernos, if you ask a question, they'll try to get you totally off base by either getting you upset or in an argument, and she would always do that and she'd yell at me and she'd swear at me and she'd call me names and I'd say Marjorie 
That's not what we're talking about. We have to stay on focus. You know, let's go back to the question. And because I didn't yell back and stand up and walk out and all the things that she would use to get the interview to end, she would get extremely frustrated. (laughs) And you could see it in her face. She's going, oh, no, this guy's not getting angry. And that's how she learned how to avoid answering all the important questions. And then finally, uh, she thought she was helping herself in a way. So she'd say, well, okay, if you saw me at the uh, place where the call was made, which was a Shell gas station, if you saw me there when the call was made ordering those pizzas, then I guess I must have been there. But I was there because... Bill Rothstein told me to be there, and I didn't know why I was there. Mm -hmm. Or if I was at the tower site where they put the bomb around Brian Wells' neck, I probably was there, but I don't know what they were doing back there. I wasn't watching. So she put her her own self in all these places where the event took place, but admit having knowledge of what was happening. And it just didn't make sense to anybody but her as a defense. And then certainly we had other information that that indicated that she had involvement. And it just really was an amazing trial, three weeks long of of different people coming in and, and outlining the story. But the real problem that she had was that the ride along she took with us, with her attorney in the car, and by the way, This was not the attorney that she fired. She actually had a personal attorney prior to being uh, given a a court-appointed attorney after she was charged. And he let her ride with us in a car and go look at different sites where the uh, pizza bomber all took place. And she would say, yep, I was here, but again, I don't know why I was here. Yes, I was here, but I don't know why... And she was even sitting across from the bank watching it being robbed with binoculars, but said, well, I was sitting in the car, but I didn't know what we were watching. (laughs) So none of it made any sense, again, to anybody. So it just shows you that even if you're extremely intelligent, it doesn't make you criminally savvy. And so those those two can be very, very different. Can I I ask you a question about her father? Because you were saying that he was possibly going to be her seventh victim. Yes. Um, and so he had money, and, and what did he, did he testify in court? Very interesting case that he had almost $2 million at one point. And Marjorie Deals, Armstrong's mother, passed away, and Marjorie wanted to get some of that money at that point. And the father said, no, that's, you know, that's mine, and we're going to keep that. And that was frustrating her immensely. So she said, well, the only way I'm going to get this is if I kill my father. And she started, you know, talking to some of her friends, including Ken Barnes. And that's when she said, hey, will you kill my father? And he said, yeah, I'll kill your father, but you need $250,000. And she said, well, where am I going to get that? And, And that's when this whole plot to rob the bank came. So if you notice, even in the bank robbery notes, uh, the amount of money they were looking for in the robbery and in the bank notes was, we need 250000 in cash, and that was the, the money that she was going to pay Ken Barnes to kill her father. Mm. And what's amazing, Jerry, is she even came up with different scenarios for him, and Ken Barnes would tell us, she said, well, why don't you push him down the steps, and you know he'll fall all the way down, he'll look like it was just an older gentleman and he fell and you know it was an accident and ken barnes even had her draw a map of her own dad's house and i had that drawing it it just was chilling so did he testify ken barnes the father did not testify the ken barnes did though okay ken barnes came in and then her father passed away while she was um still in jail and he had given away all that money to friends and neighbors. And that just fried her. She could not stand it. And we were What wait wait a minute. So she he knows she's gone to trial for trying to get money to kill him so that she could take 
the, her inheritance. Right. But she's upset because when he does die, his, he leaves her out of the will. He leaves her out of the will. And that just, oh, she was so mad. And my co-author, Ed oh, she couldn't under She couldn't understand why. Oh, no, the connection she could not make between, hey, you know, I want you dead, but you know what, uh, you still should give me the money. And it just, it, and we interviewed him three times. I interviewed Harold Deal, her father, three times. And he just said to me, and I felt so bad for this guy, because here his daughter, you know, he knew she was trying to have him killed. And he said, she's a bad seed. I'll never forget the words he used. He said, she's just a bad seed. And I thought, wow, you know, a father knowing that their daughter's trying to kill them and, and, and you know, just the whole thing just was so painful for him. And he died basically alone after uh, giving away all that money. It was really, really sad overall. I had interrupted you. You were going to tell me something that, that Ed had mentioned about that, about the will and uh, yeah. her not getting the money. Ed Palatella talked to her uh, all the way up until maybe one month before her death. And she died in prison at Carswell, Texas, which is a federal correctional institution in Texas where they have a female medical um, service uh, capability. And she died in there April 4th of this year, 2017. But up until her maybe a month before she died, she was still calling Ed Palatella from uh, the Erie Times News where he writes. And she'd call him collect and just complain and say that, you know, she's she's being held illegally and, you know, she would never admit any involvement in anything. And then Ed would say, well, tell me, Marge, how do, how do you shoot two different you know, people, a boyfriend and a husband, and then a third boyfriend, and she she just always had some, and again, back to those three different uh, defense techniques, you know, projection or rationalization of how she did what she did. And she took that with her to her grave. The real sad part is she died completely, completely alone. She had no siblings. She had no relatives. Her parents were both dead. And nobody came to claim her body. And it just, I don't know, it, even to this day, I have not heard if anybody ever took her or if she ends up in, you know, a, a potter's field, so to speak. I, I don't know whatever happened to her. What did she die of? She had cancer. And... She had it started as breast cancer, and she was getting treatment in the jail. In fact, at one point we were determining whether we were even going to take her to trial because we didn't know how long um, she had to live. But at the time, the doctors were saying probably three to five years, and she went, I think, seven total years uh, with that cancer. So she was even too ornery uh, to die, it seemed. <laughs> It was funny. A lot of people called me from the AP and different places after her death, uh, asking for my, you know, sort of feelings about that. And I, I kept saying the same thing. You know, I have mixed emotions about it because she's a human being. You know, she was somebody's daughter and child, but she just had a, you know, an evilness to her. And so, did I feel bad as a human? Yes. I mean. You don't like to see anybody uh, as a human being die of anything. But uh, was there a side of me that said, you know, it's sort of, I don't know. And she used the word karma all the time. And she used to tell me, oh, I'll never forget this, Jerry. I'd be interviewing him and she, she'd say, Jerry Clark, karma's a, excuse my French, but is a bitch. And you better watch yourself. Like she was almost trying to put a curse on me. Mm. And I'd say, Marge. And she was highly into astrology and numbers, and she'd ask me my birthday. and It was like she was trying to put this hex over me. And every time I I feel you know like I was you know sick or something, I think, Oh no, did Marjorie have something to do with this? I'm not feeling so well. I don't know if I 
did something that Marjorie's coming <laughs> back to me, but um, it's it's amazing that woman, and I'll always consider myself very. This sounds so odd, Jerry, but you as an investigator know you have a rare opportunity when you're interviewing somebody like her. And that's why, like I said, when we when we started this book, and by the way, we go through a number of different really interesting serial killers in the book. Um, Elizabeth Bathory, way back in the 1600s, who was called the female Dracula. She killed hundreds of young girls and servants. Uh, Marianne Cotton is another one, a nurse. And a, and a Sunday school teacher who killed 21 uh, different people back in the 1800s. So we start all the way back. Uh, it's not just a book about Marge, but Marge is sort of again the the the, the sort of the crux of the case study. But uh, a, a female serial killer, Lydia Sherman, who was called the Derby Poisoner back in the late 1800s, because she was from Derby, Connecticut. She killed husbands and, and some of her children. Uh, another one, Nanny Doss, uh, the giggling grandma, she killed in the 1950s. So we go through a number of different, and then certainly Eileen Wuornos, who killed seven uh, back in the 90s, I guess 89 and 90. Were, and, weren't most of those men either her lovers or her husbands? For Eileen Wuornos, they were she was a prostitute, and so they were basically, um, you know, Johns picking her up oh, for, okay. uh, for sexual encounters, and she'd have her taken, driven to a you know a remote location, and she'd pull out a gun and and shoot him. And if you listen to her story, it's very similar to Marge. It's amazing where she rationalized and and projected and said these these guys were going to mistreat me. Well, you were in a prostitute, you know, uh, John relationship, you know, so there was some of that sort of inherent in what you were doing, and but she couldn't see that, you know, it was it was their fault. They deserved it. They they were the ones that uh, that were were deserving of being killed because of how they were treating me, and it was almost the same exact thinking pattern that Marjorie had. And that's why we we love the connection between Wernos and, and Marjorie Deal Armstrong. It's just it's just amazing. Um and I'm not one to think that, you know, a woman is above being a serial killer, mm-hmm. but it still is just amazing to 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 think about it because most people just don't associate uh, you know, women as as having that level of evilness to just dispose of people that they don't like. No, you're right, and and they've been said that that females, you know, in in, in some of the older uh, female serial killers, they thought were operating again out of this uh, sort of false compassion to do the right thing, but it, it never really was accurate but that's how they viewed that and then that you saw females moving more towards profit and power for their killing motives and methods right. as, as we got more closely but they still tend to kill people that they know or are closer to them than some of the people that were the random male killers like Bundy and, and Gacy sort of random in, in how they selected people uh, they often also used quieter methods so poisons and drugs, like I talked about, smothering, uh, you know, different, less less violent means, uh, weapons and things, but it's still murder, you know, and you still see um, this evolution, though, of females getting, uh, and this is exactly to what you were just mentioning, um, more violent just for the sake of violence like men than you saw years ago. And you see this developing, and it's it's sort of a scary uh, thought because we always thought women didn't have that um, lack of empathy, compassion that you might see in a male antisocial personality disorder. But it's coming out that they're they're, they're very similar. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yes. So. Is there, you talked about Eileen and, and how mm-hmm. she um, was 
did you know kill men that she didn't know you know her her customers right is is there anyone in recent times that is like a Gacy or a Bundy I mean she got close to that how many people did she kill uh Marjorie had six deaths around her and and Eileen Wernos had seven um yeah you have anybody that has uh, I just was talking to um and I know you know her Mary Ellen O'Toole oh yes Yes, and she was talking about the Green River killer in yes. Seattle who confessed to like 49 killings or, or, or murders. Is there any woman that comes anywhere near that? Are, are, are Marjorie and Eileen at seven and six right. the, the closest that uh, we get? And that's a good thing. I'm not complaining. I'm not, right. I'm not saying girl power. Let's go right. for it. Yeah. That's right. That's <laughs> I'm just right. wondering if, if we've gotten anywhere near that in recent times. We haven't so, seen anything um, like that, that's, that's but we don't thing. know that they're not out there. You know what I mean? It's it's possible that there's somebody that could be out there, um, but no, we haven't seen those kind of numbers. And by the way, Mary Ellen O'Toole and I go all the way back to this collar bomb where she did the profile for us. Oh, and her okay. and I worked together so uh so hard and long and she is I have such respect for uh Dr. O'Toole um and we still talk to this day. So that's fascinating that you had her also because uh I just am one of her biggest fans. Okay, good. You know what I'll do? I'll put these back to back. Oh, that <laughs> I, I haven't I haven't posted her interview yet, so I'll put them back to back because I think it'll be fascinating oh. for her to talk about serial killers and then to have yours with a another case study right after it. So, oh, I'll, that would be fantastic. She she's um she's certainly one of the best and has seen a lot of different things. And what I love about her and uh and and sort of similar to what I had was that psychology background and I think that's so important in dealing with people like this if you don't understand the psychology of why people do what they do I don't think you have the advantage going into these interviews and uh, every interview with her was so important for me and my case that if I if I didn't have that background I don't know that I would have been able to do what I was able to do with her to get the information that that we needed in the case. So it's so helpful. Absolutely. Well, is there uh, anything else that's, that's in the book that you would like to cover before we end the interview? I'll tell you what. I think the book does a nice job of not just looking at, all right, here's a killer. She killed this many. Uh, it looks at a lot of psychology, and again, I just talked about that a second ago. But I'm I'm so wrapped up in you know why people do things, not what they do necessarily. Because if you look at different cases, you could kill somebody if you wanted to kill somebody in ten different ways. It's really why people want another person dead, and the why is so important to me as a psychology investigator. And that's why this book is so interesting because it walks through not only the history of these people, but the history of, you know, the psychology behind it. And that, to me, I think separates it from just some of the factual listing of names and numbers of people they killed. And I think that's why, and hope, hope, that's why it'll be a good read for um people who who are able to pick it up. Okay, so the name of the book again is... Mania and Marjorie Deal Armstrong, Inside the Mind of a Female Serial Killer. And it's on pre-order now, but will be available uh, Uh, September 16th. Exactly, and it's through Roman and Littlefield, the publisher, and uh, it's on all those sites right now for pre-order, so Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, and such. Well, I wish you good luck with that. So I know that we covered it in uh, episode 13 when we first spoke with you, but if you could just tell people what you're doing now. You know, this has been such a blessed life that I've had. Um, 
I was able, you know, with that education now to take it over to the university where I live here in Erie, Pennsylvania, Gannon University, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, really the chair of the department now, and I, I teach the new, hopefully up-and-coming investigators coming out that are going to go out and do great things like you and, and uh, all the other FBI agents and local police departments and state police and district attorneys and uh public defenders. I mean, I just love the whole criminal justice system. And if I have a small part now in sharing some of the knowledge I've learned over the years with these uh, up-and-coming students here at Gannon University, I'm, I'm just thrilled to death. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Jerry Clark. You'll also find photos of him with Marjorie Dell Armstrong. There's a couple of newspaper articles about Marjorie and her case and trial. There's a link to that eight-part FBI series on serial killers. And, of course, there's a link to Jerry Clark and Ed Palatella's new book, Mania and Marjorie Dell Armstrong, Inside the Mind of a Female Serial Killer. If you enjoyed the interview, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you. At the bottom of the episode show notes at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find all the social media share buttons. And of course, if you're listening to this podcast on your phone, you can share the episode directly from your device. I have been looking forward to giving you my crime fiction recommendation, The Late Show by Michael Connolly. I have been reading Michael Connolly's books forever. Harry Bosch and The Lincoln Lawyer. And now he has introduced a new character, a female character. The book is about Renee Ballard, a detective who works the night shift, also known as The Late Show. It is her responsibility to begin investigations, but finish none of them, because each morning she has to turn everything over to the day shift. But Ballard is assigned two cases that she is determined not to give up at dawn. Against orders and her partner's wishes, she works both cases by day while maintaining her shift by night, even though both cases place her in harm's way. Although I'm still getting used to this new character, I recommend the book and look forward to Michael Connolly developing the character more and answering some of the questions that I had about who she really is. While you're at Amazon.com picking up your copy of The Late Show by Michael Connolly, I hope you'll also check out my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play. And don't forget to sign up for my FBI Retired Case File Review Reader Team. At the first of the month, I send out an email that has information about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And when you sign up, I'll send you the FBI Reading Resource, which is a resource of books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have appeared on this podcast crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. If you're interested in being a member of my reader team, just go to jerrywilliams.com and sign up when you see the pop-up. This episode was sponsored by fbiretired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you. Thank you.